Well, so the US passed the Inflation Reduction Act eight months ago last August. If you told me 10 months ago we'd have a climate bill, I would probably not have believed you. But we do, and it's a huge deal. Truly historic. The major victory. We've changed the world. US federal government has said that we're gonna spend something like $500 billion, and the fancy schmancy energy system models say that all that spending is gonna reduce US greenhouse gas emissions by 37 to 41% below 2005 levels by the end of this decade. Not quite the 50% by 2030 President Biden has been promising, but a step in that direction. More than half of the spending on this bill goes into how we make and store electricity, and most of that is tax incentives for renewable energy development and storage. Rant on that later. But first, why am I making this video more than a half a year after the bill was passed? Well, because I wanted to know if anything has happened yet. Are those hundreds of billions of dollars actually getting spent? Is it going to people that really need it? Will it reduce fossil fuel use, shut down peaker plants poisoning fence line communities, and build a just transition? Can it mitigate drought impacts in tribal communities and provide equitable access to clean water? And the question that I saw a lot of folks asking when it passed, is the good going to outweigh the bad? To try to answer those questions, I first called up Raya Salter, an energy justice and movement lawyer who is deep in the weeds of the New York climate and energy policy space. The Inflation Reduction Act is a really important piece of legislation. It is, of course, the largest investment in climate that the United States um, as a country has ever made. However, there is a lot of good in the IRA and there is a lot of bad in the IRA. It is not the Green New Deal that a lot of us advocates really wanted. And we're very concerned about what that's going to mean for environmental justice communities in terms of oil and gas development and, of course, all communities in terms of permitting. Despite these very real worries, let me just put on my excited hat for a second. The federal government has written, passed, and signed a law that moves billions of dollars, the largest investment in climate change response the US has ever done, and it isn't even close. This bill made it across the finish line when most people thought it was impossible, and has real potential to clean up our grid and build healthier communities. And even more importantly, it invests directly in environmental justice. But all this money and intention isn't the end of the story. Now that we have all this funding, it is extra important that we continue to pay attention and make sure the money goes where it is needed the most. That is particularly important when it comes to the money for environmental justice. As laws tend to be, it isn't explicit about how exactly the money needs to be spent. It'll be up to agencies, like the Environmental Protection Agency, to decide how these programs are executed. This creates a lot of room for inconsistent implementation of environmental justice provisions across agencies. So we have to pay a lot of attention and hold these agencies accountable to make sure that the demands for environmental justice are met. So what is actually in the IRA? Well, you could read it, link downstairs, but it's over 700 pages long. Though the margins are hilariously large, like an overtired senior's final paper that they were gonna hit the page limit and put not a drop more effort into. Here's a super quick summary. So like I said, the biggest chunk of spending is on energy. The next largest, manufacturing. So trying to reduce emissions in the creation of all those things we're funding to make and store electricity, while simultaneously building up the clean energy manufacturing sector in the US. We've talked about it on here before, but buildings are some of the largest sources of emissions in the United States. So fittingly, the third largest category of spending throws money at things like improving building energy efficiency and, near and dear to my heart, incentivizing heat pump installations. Next, we've got transportation. This is where the electric vehicle tax credit fits in, but also includes funding for electrifying the United States Postal Service fleet and cleaning up air pollution around major ports. The next biggest spending category after transportation is all about environmental justice and land use. So cleaning up pollution, reinstating the Superfund, environmental justice block grants, and a bunch of resilience projects. Last, and also I suppose technically also least in terms of allocated funding, is a little over $21 billion earmarked for agriculture. And that's mostly conservation, climate-friendly ag techniques like cover cropping, low tillage, and methane management from all those burping cows, plus dealing with nitrous oxide emissions. Basically, it's throwing money at ways of reducing the big three greenhouse gas emissions, CO2, CH4, and N2O, that are wrapped up in our agricultural system. So one of the good things about the IRA is it really does have significant funds to help states and local governments implement um, climate action. And states like New York that have been very progressive and have made concrete plans on how we can get there, what it's going to cost and what the benefits are, really stand in a place to benefit and almost get an unfair share. And since New York already has these plans in place and local organizations and government reps are at the ready, having all these extra federal dollars coming in is a huge deal. 
But how exactly all that money is going to be used, what is it going to fund, is still an open question. One of the risks is that the IRA is ready to throw money at a lot of technologies, like carbon capture, which until I see otherwise is really just being used by fossil fuel interests to say they're cleaning up their act when they're not. Keep your eye on the ball. Is the money and the infrastructure being used to move on the trajectory away from combustion and away from fossil fuel? Or is it being used in a way that will maintain fossil fuel infrastructure and fossil fuel products? It's like as easy as that. Potentially, the Justice 40 initiative can help with that. One of the first things Biden did was sign an executive order that included this goal of getting 40% of the overall benefits from the federal investments to flow to disadvantaged communities. And because the Inflation Reduction Act is a whole bunch of federal funding, the new programs being built across all the various government agencies need to meet this goal. But as you can imagine, the bureaucracy in the wheels of the federal government, they move slow and query in terms of, you know, how is that going to roll out in an equitable way? One of the things that folks have been very concerned about is what is the criteria for who is a disadvantaged community? And a lot of folks have been working on maps and trying to figure this out, but something the federal government has not done is include actual race as a factor, which environmental justice advocates like myself have been perturbed about because you can't take the R out of environmental racism and you can't take the J out of environmental justice. Well, one big hurdle to all that is those tax incentives. Tax credits are one of the primary ways the IRA is trying to nudge us into an energy transition and incentivize clean energy developments, which unexamined doesn't sound that bad. Give people money when they make or buy good stuff. But unfortunately, we live in a super broken world, and if history is any indication, all those tax credits are just going to benefit the wealthy and white households. The Congressional Budget Office found that in 2019, the households in the top 1% by income received about as much in tax credits as the bottom 40%. If you take something like the cheapest electric car you can buy somewhere in the $30,000 range, even if you add the maximum tax credit, that's still a lot of money. However, starting 2024, thanks to the High Efficiency Electric Home Rebate Act, the IRA is making it easier for those without the upfront cash to get the benefits of electrification. So those who qualify as low income are eligible for up to $14,000 at the time of purchase for things like heat pumps, electric cooktops, air sealing, and all the accompanying insulation costs. Moderate income households are also eligible for up to 50% upfront discounts up to that same $14,000. This alleviates some of the inherent inequality in a tax credit because you don't need to first purchase the thing, then wait until you file your taxes to get the money back. It's not perfect, and you can run through that 14K pretty quickly, but it is a serious significant investment in home energy efficiency for low-income households, and we haven't really had anything like it before nationally. And then there's the grants. Many of the grants in the Inflation Reduction Act are competitive, and we're starting to see these long, complicated applications that by their very nature are pitting environmental organizations against each other. And this just hurts the smaller, most local organizations who don't have a grant writing office or any kind of capacity to take advantage of the money available in the IRA. At this point, an organization would need to hire a person or a team of people just to know when what grants are available and apply for them in time. And while it may get a sizable chunk of the funding, energy justice is just one piece of this bill and its implications. Folks working in the water justice space are seeing basically the same thing. And to talk about that, uh, we found another lawyer, actually. So good morning. My name is Heather Tanana. I'm a citizen of the Navajo Nation. On my mother's side, I'm of European descent, and on my father's side, my clans are the Towering House and Black Street Woods people. I am also a assistant research professor at the University of Utah's Law School. Now, the Inflation Reduction Act, with respect to water, it's really narrowed in on drought responses. So $4 billion went to reclamation for drought resiliency efforts, and how that's going to pan out isn't totally clear right now. Tribes can definitely access some of that funding and we can use creative solutions like updating infrastructure that currently is losing a lot of water, right? That might be a measure because you're putting in more climate resilient systems, but it's less directly targeted at tribal drinking water projects. I will note there is $550 million that Reclamation also got specific to domestic supply water projects for disadvantaged groups. And again, like, how are they going to implement that? They're still working it out. 
We're seeing the same story everywhere. There's a lot of money, a lot of needed projects, but the IRA is so recent agencies are still scrambling to figure out internal structures and implementation plans. And like with the environmental justice grants, tribal communities don't necessarily have the capacity to find, apply for, and then use the money that is available. There are these federal programs though that are really complicated to navigate and we have so many different federal agencies. We counted up well over seven, probably seven to 12 different programs, depending on your needs, that could be accessed for tribal water. And how do you piece all of those together, right? That is really hard for communities to do because of past, you know, policies and lingering, right, systematic racism and discrimination that we have. A lot of these communities are under resourced. They don't have that expertise that, say, the you know community across the street that's predominantly white would have. And that's exactly the situation with our tribes. And, and again, directly connected in with the boarding school era, like child welfare removals that they lost a lot of expertise that otherwise they would have had. Because of this, tribal communities are reliant on the federal government to follow through on its promises and build programs that make it easier for them to access funds. And not to be too optimistic, but there is some progress there. If we look at the Infrastructure and Jobs Act that was passed in 2021 and has had a bit more of a runway to get projects from funded to in practice. Yeah, the Infrastructure Jobs Act, since that came out first, uh, we've seen a little more progress. and the biggest amount of money was that $3.5 billion awarded to Indian Health Service for their sanitation facilities construction program. And just, gosh, it was probably this past month, they put out a news press with a website that's tracking the projects that they're working on with that IGEM money. It just shows the magnitude of the problem. You know, I think people tend to think, oh, okay, I heard a lot about Navajo, so it must really be Southwest focused. And yeah, the Southwest has a lot of need, but you go up into Alaska, a lot of deficiencies up there, and then also in the East. And so it, it gives a good picture of one, where tribal homes are located in the US, and then also kind of the need that they're trying to address and how big of a problem it is. So it's not something that can be solved overnight for sure, but IHS is very much working to get out those dollars. And that's a program, right, that is fully uh, managed by the federal government right now. The U.S. government is often really slow and often needs to be yelled at or have a strongly worded public commented at to actually get the funding where it's needed. Fortunately, folks are starting to build up the programs and groups to make sure as much information is available so that the people that need the funding can get it without waiting for the U.S. government to figure everything out. So the universal access to clean water, we have a website, tribalcleanwater.org, and we've put out two different reports so far and really looking at the different federal programs that are available. That was our first report to fill these gaps. And then the second one was recommendations of how to make those programs more efficient, some regulatory changes that the agency could make so that tribes are more easily able to access funding. And then right now we're doing exactly that. We're putting together a tribal handbook for tribes to be able to use to navigate the system. Because again, definitely not easy or intuitive. And the Inflation Reduction Act is far from perfect, but it is a lot of money slushing around that could and will do some real good out in the world. So long as it actually gets to the people and organizations who need it. And while yes, the Inflation Reduction Act and the bipartisan infrastructure bill before it are these large pieces of legislation, we, and by we, I mean you and me, have to stay involved. We aren't the ones deciding where the money goes, but we can still have a say in what the future of the IRA builds. Just because we got this landmark legislation doesn't mean our job is done. So if you're itching for a way to get involved, I've got some good news. This video is funded in part by the Let's Get Loud campaign, which is embodying this idea that we need to keep informed and loud about the issues we care about. So if you'd like to learn more or participate in an action, head to getloud.org or follow the links downstairs for more information. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.